Yeah, I'm saying the underlying issue is not technology. It's it's actually the fact that they don't have the income for it. The issue is not like a technical issue. It's a unfortunate feature of inequality in society. It has nothing to do with underlying technology. It's like if you don't have the money to save to invest and you live paycheck to paycheck, you can't invest. It has nothing to do with like, I can't get access to this because it's too you know complicated or expensive or whatnot. It's a lack of savings. I mean, we can do the math and we can argue about the actual, like what that population size looks like and what the actual investable dollars of their savings look like and all this. But I would argue it's a fairly tiny market and, and actually getting, in a sense, beaten up and chipped at by the neobanks that are now picking up more and more consumers in all of these countries as like these digital first banks, like it's already happening, right? It's coming from the banking system through the new, the, the neobanks. So you've seen this in Brazil, you're seeing this in, in Mexico, you're seeing it in Colombia. Uh, you know, there's like a massive adoption of neobanks and you're going to continue to see this across, across the globe. So I kind of look at it as like this tiny market that's shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. I understand this is just one UK use case, but this use case to me adds up from a dollar's perspective to be reasonably small and extremely hard to make money in. Extremely hard to make money, even if it exists. Like if you're going to make money as a middleman provider, you have to charge somebody something, right? Yeah, I'm not arguing about how much money I make from this. I'm arguing about the importance is unlocking financial markets for a few hundred million or a billion people. Yeah, but you can't unlock it unless you have a for-profit company that can provide that service. That's just not true. The whole point of crypto is the entire cost of providing financial market services effectively collapses to zero. You go on Serum, I mean, market makers charge their spread, but like there's just no other cost. And then gas fees, which is a fraction of a penny. For a digital asset, I totally agree with you. For a pure digital asset where you can prove ownership of that digital asset, sure. Well, this is my entire point to begin with, is that the entire premise of the exact current stack on which assets are represented is broken because you're saying this is only true for digital assets. But like at the end of the day, a stock certificate on the DTCC and a share of Sol and Solana blockchain are for all practical purposes, the same thing. Now there's, I realize mechanical and legal differences because of the last hundred years of history, but like you're representing a share of a thing and like you want to be able to trade it. Like that's the core premise. Yes, I guess my, my point is that there's a reason why, as you said, like 100 years of regulatory and kind of consumer protection issues, as well as like compliance issues from the company side, there's, you know, reasons why you can't just... My, my point is, is that, that, that if you were to reimagine it from the ground up today, without 100 years of luggage, you would not derive what we currently have, because what we currently have does not make sense. Having, having pieces of paper in the DTCC is crazy. Having NYSE not have margining is fucking crazy. Having a web of brokers and banks hook into this whole thing who have to nod it against each other and have Robinhood have to post collateral because the price of Gate GameStop moved too much in a day is absolutely nonsensical. Like there, there are so many parts of this whole system. The fact that it's only nine to five is crazy. Like you, you, you just, you actually look at the actual mechanics of how these markets work, both commodity markets, which are largely unregulated and equities markets, which are obviously much more regulated. Like, and they, they're just like completely don't make sense. If you look at FTX and Binance through the last 24 months and you look at CME and LSE and whatever else, like the crypto markets uh, ignore three arrows blowing up and those kinds of things, which were just unsecured credit issues. Like Binance and FTX function way better than NYSE and LSE and everything else. I mean, not LSE, London, whatever, Mercantile Exchange, whatever it's called, CME. Um, because they're actually derived from first principles to be structured as correct financial markets. No, they are fully collateralized purchasing of an underlying crypto asset. Like, yes, if I hand you the money immediately for the underlying asset, you're not going to blow up, right? Because there's no credit risk being taken. I totally agree. And that just limits the opportunity to things that you can transfer money immediately for without any, you don't want to offer credit to anybody, right? You need to provide the individual dollar to go and grab that thing right away. And all that does is shrink the market for potential buyers to be significantly smaller. That means everybody's got to come up with the cash to buy everything all the time right away. Like the history of financial markets and the reason why financial markets are so interesting as like a market expander is because we can issue credit. Like credit is a feature, right? Credit is something that is really interesting to financial markets because it allows you to take a dollar of savings and turn it into $10 of lending. And that grows the opportunity for that dollar to continue. This is like the, you know, the basics of, of banking, right? Like my savings become somebody else's borrowing. And all of a sudden I can take my dollar of savings and turn it into multiple dollars of lending because there's an intermediary taking on that credit risk. And that intermediary is ultimately growing the economy by doing the lending and taking on that credit risk. That's like 
you know, finance in a nutshell, if you will, not the whole thing, but pieces of it. And I agree with you in, in crypto, if I have to put up the dollar to get the thing and that dollar has to be there right away, perfect in the sense, right? There's no credit risk inherently because there's no credit. But without credit, what's the point of the financial system? It's just dollar for dollar trading of assets. Like, sure, that exists, but that's going to shrink the system completely. When you do it from first principles, you would never design it in that way because you can't introduce credit. The minute you start to introduce credit, to your point, you get these blowups, right? Because you get third parties who are ultimately taking on borrowing and lending risk. And every once in a while, they blow up. I mean, like, but you can have those, those two things are not mutually exclusive. You can have the core exchange be running in this way and then you can have banks extend credit on top of that which is what you know, how a lot of it works today but like literally in the case of london uh whatever the london mercantile exchange and lithium or iron or nickel whatever whatever the i think was a few a few months ago they literally unwound the trades like that is that is theft that is the definition of theft like you unwind the trades i mean like th that is just not okay I, there are, there are gates in point. We can talk about like the pros and cons of being able to unwind trades. Like I, I understand in a perfect conceptual system, you know, you never have to unwind anything because nobody ever blows up. Nobody ever makes a mistake, but that's just not how reality plays out. Like, you know, the immediate instant liquidation of everybody, if there's like a price spike, I, I continue to argue is not a feature of a financial system. It is a bug, like the ability to normally unwind a system where you've got like liquidity dries up and you have credit spread all over the place and you have to figure out like who actually has the money 99 out of a hundred times it is better to have that version of the system because you can get like an organized deleveraging event yes there are there are situations and i'm not familiar with every individual one but there definitely have been situations where you've seen trades unwound and it feels like the insiders have won I think that's a very fair statement. And like, you look at those and you're like, this is kind of bullshit. Like, I can't believe. And I think the example Kyle's talking about was one of those things. Now we could, yeah, it, it, was yeah. a, it was a mess, but uh, yes. It's, it's hard to argue with like, yes, every once in a while, the ability to reverse a trade gets abused by the massive insiders. And there's like some unfair outcomes that do happen. And that's a trade you make for the 99 other times where actually that like deleveraging event in a normal orderly fashion is a really good thing because you don't see these like giant immediate blowups and then people lose all their money. Uh, anyway, I, I think this idea of like the fact that in crypto, I can like hand you a dollar and you give me the thing is actually like a severely limiting factor for most financial markets because in most financial markets, you actually do want to extend credit because without credit, businesses that own illiquid assets, people who don't have the money right away, people who are about to get paid, they are unable or unable to participate in the financial ecosystem because they don't have the cash. This is what this is the credit system, what brokers do. This is what banks do. I, I mean, it's funny because I do a lot of these conversations and I realize sometimes maybe this is the case, there's like, I view something as a feature that the other person views as a bug. And we kind of like religiously disagree. That might be the case, the case here. But I do think it's important to acknowledge the benefits of having these middlemen and brokers and kind of like credit issuing entities.